Hey y'all, this is me again, Ayub from the Tech Cave. I'm here today to discuss yet another important architectural pattern when designing software and modern web applications, which is the event-driven architecture. This video lesson is before the last in the software architecture series, and it's probably the most important one. Alright, so we'll break the routine and change our usual method when discussing architectural patterns. In this lesson, we will start by observing how an event-driven system works as a first step. And as we walk through the case, don't be afraid or don't hesitate to ask questions. Any questions such as, what's this component? How does this work exactly? Is event-driven suitable for all cases? Are robots really gonna take over the world? <laughs> Alright, you may want to leave the last question for a later video. And after we get a glimpse over how event-driven systems work, we will dive into the architectural pattern and talk about it in detail. We will see its components, its characteristics, etc. Next, we will talk about implementation approaches and how event-driven systems are built. And of course, as always, we will see the pros and cons of this pattern, followed by technologies used in this architecture. And finally, we will address some pitfalls and important considerations to take into account. Okay then, let's enter the event-driven world. So, even though the concept of events is almost as old as the art of programming itself, event-driven architecture or event-based solutions emerged and evolved to solve issues that started to appear in recent software architectures such as SOA microservices and essentially patterns that involve distributed computing. One of the common problems is that with new types of platforms and business models and recently with big data and Internet of Things technologies and systems, SOA microservices and cloud technologies alone became unsuitable or insufficient to meet the needs of modern organizations. The famous request-response approach in building distributed software systems started to become less sexy recently. Why? Because today, consumers and stakeholders cannot stand delays and passivity of systems. We want to know about everything as it happens or immediately after it happens. We don't want to miss any important event or recent fresh data that could represent new insights, change of trends, new behavior, etc. Basically, we want to know everything as it happens, and by everything, generally speaking, I mean any change of state. And this is not possible with the common command approach which is based on the request response model. Using this model, we only know when the service consumer or client want us to know, or we have to keep polling or checking to see if something has changed. The only way to be real-time and achieve the responsiveness required by today's requirements is to be event-driven. And please note that I'm not saying in any way that the request response model is completely bad or useless. It's just not enough for our current needs. Alright, now let's look at a real world example in action to understand the importance of this architecture. Let's consider for example a healthcare software system that is responsible for remote patient monitoring, treatment progress observation, doctor appointments and maintenance of vaccination and periodic check schedules. The system is cloud-based, of course, and incorporates Internet of Things devices for its functioning. And there are many client applications to this system for patients, for doctors, for the staff members, and for external entities. If the architecture of the system is based on the command request response approach, there will be a lot of tedious work to do by users of the system because when something changes or when something is done, performing the next step is a matter of actively sending a request to the system, that is to say, to command it to do something, because in this case, the software system is unaware and unable to tell if something has changed or done with. If blood pressure, for example, of a patient raises, the nurse or the patient herself needs to notify the system by clicking over something or generally sending a request to inform interested parties. Or if we want to inform a person that she has an appointment or her child needs vaccination, nurses or staff members need to keep track of patients' records and consistently check if the appointment is near, then sends a request to the system which in turn will notify the patient. You can see how this could be very tedious. And yes, there are some smart hacks to work around this issue using the request response model, but it is just a hack. And that is in the best case scenario. Worst case scenario, this model could cause a lot of damages or even could result in failure to save lives because interested parties were unable to capture facts instantly. Now, without saying much, I'll let you imagine if the system is event-based and everything is based
based on action reaction instead of command based. In this case, the system has a sort of intelligence and is aware of everything that happens. Even better, handling events could be automated and thus less human intervention is needed in this case. The advantages of this approach is not only less tedious work, better monitoring and instantaneous capturing of facts, but also learning about common patterns and patient behaviors, detailed logging of events, increased performance and many other benefits as we'll see in the next section. It's probably clear in the healthcare software system case that the event-driven approach is the most appropriate way to go. However, the need for an event-based model is less apparent for other cases such as e-commerce, web applications, online learning platforms, for example, etc. For these types of systems, the event-based model could be beneficial in some common or other different ways. Asynchronicity or asynchronous and real-time systems are the norm today. And the only way to achieve this is to become event driven. But wait, does this mean I'm overriding or understating the things we said about SOA and microservices in previous videos and how they are a good fit for modern systems? Actually, no. And in fact, event driven is not a separate architecture per se. It's usually used as a complementary solution for service oriented and microservices architectures. All right, now that we have a 20,000 foot view about event driven systems and how they are used, let's now get a close look and talk about the inner workings of this architectural pattern. First, let's see the main components in an event-driven system. The first and most important component is, well, the event. An event in event-based systems is a message that represents a fact and is created when a change of an observed value happens, such as an action by a user, an increase or decrease of something, a condition that becomes true, etc. This message or event is generated or captured by what is referred to as the event generator or the event collector. It's the same thing, which is the element or entity that sensed or detected the fact and informed the system. The event generator could be a monitoring agent, a sensor, a middleware, etc. All right, so this captured fact is called the initial event and it's usually a message. For example, an HTTP message or some other type and it contains two parts, event header and the event body. The header contains metadata about the event such as the timestamp, event type, ID, etc. And the body contains the change of state that happened. An event is captured so that interested parties could react to what happened. One or more components could be interested in a particular event and so the system's responsibility is to notify the interested parties that an event has occurred so that those concerned components could react to it. And it's important to note that the event message is not equivalent to the request in the request response model. It's actually of a very different nature. A typical request informs the system what is to be done and could contain data to process as well as information about how to process it. An event on the other hand simply tells the system what happened and it includes metadata about the event and it does not tell how to react to it. The other information is included or generated by other components. Returning to the healthcare system we talked about earlier, an initial event could be, God forbid, patient stopped breathing or appointment X is in 24 hours or machine A is down. After the event is captured, it's inserted into an event queue before it gets processed. Then if the system is mediator based, and we will talk about that in a minute, the event gets passed down to the mediator, which in turn creates another event out of the initial event that is called the processing event. This event is the input to the component that will handle it and do what's necessary. All right. And also an initial event could have many processing events if there is more than one component that will react to the initial event. A processing event is a modified event message for a particular reaction. Let's say for example the machine A is down event has been generated. After being transferred from the event queue to the mediator, the latter will process the event and reformat it so that components could analyze it correctly and send three processing events. One to a component that will start a backtracking process and try to figure out what happened with the machine, another one to a component that will notify a technician, and the third copy will be sent to an event processor that will send a message to a nurse, for example, telling her what to do and suggest a temporary solution till the original machine gets fixed. And a common design pattern that is used to implement this process 
is the pub sub pattern or publish subscribe pattern. And so occasionally you could see or hear that an event generator is called a publisher and interested parties are called subscribers or event handlers. Going deeper than this and talking about what data should event messages contain, etc., is beyond the scope of this video. If you want to know more, I'll try to provide some resources in the description section. And of course, the web is generous if you want to do some research. All right, let's move to the next component, the event queue. An event-driven system could have more than one central event queue as well as different types of queues. An event queue is a first-in, first-out or FIFO data structure that receives initial events and keeps them in order as they are received. The implementation of this component is not specified by the architectural pattern. An event queue has many benefits. We might as well do without an event queue, but in this case, the event message is sent directly to the mediator or the event handler component. The problem is things could get messy really quickly and problems could arise easily. Without an event queue, there is no way to to revert back if there is an error. Also, an event queue is commonly used to generate event log and persist it, that is to say to keep track of events and for monitoring reasons, and also for other things. So the event queue receives a particular event or a stream of events and then transfers them to the mediator or broker components for processing. And as we said for backup and recovery mechanisms, the event queue is used to generate an event log and persist it into a permanent storage system. So so that if the application suddenly crashes or in the case of an error, the system state could be rebuilt by replaying the event log. Event queues are also used to track the sequence of events. Many types of queues could be used in an event-driven system. First, the event queue. I think you have a pretty good idea about it by now. Also, there is another type of queues that are called reply queues, which are used to send a reply back to the event collector if the event is repeated invalid or for other reasons. Also, there could be two categories of event queues, read event queues that collect and handle only read events and write event queues. This is a good way to filter queues and increase efficiency and performance. Other types of queues could be used depending on the requirements and needs of the system. Next, we have event channels. Put simply, event channels are just another type of queues used in event-driven systems as a medium between mediators and event processors, and also between events and event processors in the broker topology, or between and among event processors. Yes, events could be generated by event processors. All right, event channels are also commonly implemented using topics, and this component is responsible for filtering and pre-processing events before reaching interested parties. Parties. Okay, next component is the mediator. A mediator is an integration hub component in an event-driven system. It receives events from the event queue and either transfer it to the appropriate event processor if it is a one-step event or process and divide the initial event into multiple events and orchestrate them sending individual events to their corresponding handlers. Events sent by the mediator are the processing events we talked about earlier. And it's important to know that the mediator component does not perform any business logic related to the event. It simply orchestrates the steps involved in the initial event. All right, the broker component, on the other hand, does not need central orchestration. In such simple systems, events flow through event processors using the message broker as a medium of communication between event processors. The broker component contains event channels that are used for the event flow. And finally, the event processor. An event processor is the equivalent of a microservice or a service component in a SOA system. It listens on event channels and after it receives processing events, it reacts to them performing the logic necessary to handle them. After an event processor is finished with an event, it publishes an event to the broker or event queue notifying the system that its work is done. And as we said earlier, more than one event processor could be interested in a particular event. Event processors are highly autonomous and decoupled atomic components that are completely and where when events are received by the system. Extending, scaling, or modifying the system comes with zero coupling problems. All right, now that we know about the components of an event-driven system, let's briefly talk about few principles every event-driven system should follow. 
First, anonymity. We have mentioned this before. Neither the publisher nor the event processor are aware of each other. This ensures that everything is highly loosely coupled. Another important principle event-driven systems should adhere to is self-describing payloads. This confirms what we said about the content of event messages. Only metadata is important in event messages. The detail the event message is, the better. And also there should be a mechanism through which event processors or subscribers are ensured they would receive events that interest them. Next, low latency. This means everything should be real-time or near real-time. Easier modification or extensibility. It is a key principle that both event generators and event processors can be added to the system without any explicit process definition or modification. Next we have event sourcing, meaning that every state change is captured and locked. And last but not least, pattern detection. Event driven systems should be able to detect patterns of behavior through stream of events. There are of course other recommendations and best practices when it comes to event driven systems, but these are the most common principles. All right, now that we are done with principles, let's move to characteristics. Simply having a mechanism to receive events and handle them doesn't make an application event-based. A system is called event-driven if it has the following characteristics. First, multicast communication. This means the system is able to notify more than one subscriber if needed when an event is received. Real-time is another characteristic, of course. Events are published as they occur or immediately after they are caught. Another characteristic is asynchronous communication meaning that events keep coming and do not wait for already sent events to get processed. Fine-grained communication means that all types of events are sent, even trivial simple ones, especially trivial insignificant ones. Also, the system must incorporate a mechanism by which it filters out events and classifies them based on a set of parameters. And finally, as we said in the principles section, event messages inform the system and interested parties about what happened, not how it happened, or what to do about it and so events include only metadata about the event all right with the basics covered now let's see the two implementation approaches or topologies for designing and building event driven systems so even though the major components we talked about are well defined for the event driven architecture when actually building an event driven system there are two types of implementation and they differ with regards to functionality and complexity I think we already know how they work but let's go through a brief recap the first one is the mediator topology. It is used for complicated large event-driven systems that need central orchestration. A mediator is used for events that have multiple steps to be performed. In this case, the mediator components divide the event into separate processing events, each corresponding to its individual step. And after that, it sends them to the appropriate event processors via event channels. And feel free to go back to the components section in which I explain the mediator component in more detail. The other way to build in event-driven systems is the broker topology. The broker approach is used when the system is relatively simple and does not require central orchestration. The event broker contains event channels that are used to transfer events to and from event processors. So these are the two main topologies in event-driven architecture. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is evaluate this pattern. Actually, we have already talked about most of the advantages of event-based software systems, but let's briefly list them here. First, increased or improved performance. The ability for event-driven systems to perform asynchronous parallel operations is a big gain when it comes to the overall performance. Scalability is another advantage, as we said before, and event-based systems are probably the best when it comes to scalability thanks to the extreme loose coupling between components. And speaking of which, scalability means ease of deployment, and that is also thanks to the loosely coupled autonomous nature of components. Next, versatility and adaptability. This is a very important advantage and is usually the reason for choosing the event-driven architecture. The event-based nature of the system makes it suitable to survive and thrive in unpredictable non-linear environments and circumstances. And another great gain is the evolutionary architecture of the event-based systems. The reactive nature of the system makes it possible for new processors to respond to new events as the 
business model changes. Also, real-time analytics, event sourcing, learning behaviors of the real world in real time, etc., are all great gains as well. And of course, there are limitations of the event-based approach, which can be summed up in first in the upfront investment and planning required to inspire confidence. Also, the increased complexity that comes with event-based systems due to the highly distributed nature of the system and the near impossible tracking of chain of events triggered by components if the system is large. Another limitation is the difficulty of testing and actually testing is near impossible in event-driven systems. This is why login is very important. The asynchronous nature of the system as well as its other characteristics makes it very difficult to test the system as a whole and sometimes even unit testing in certain types of events is difficult. Actually this is why monitoring and logging are extremely important in such systems. They are the only way to track and handle errors. And these were some of the challenges concerning event-driven systems. And of course, it's always a matter of trade-offs. The event-driven architecture is a sexy and actually a very useful architectural pattern, but it's not a silver bullet. Let's quickly go over some of the technologies used in event-driven systems. For the mediator component, an integration hub could be used, such as Apache Camel or Mule USB. Business process execution language is also used for describing steps required for processing initial events. For sophisticated orchestration, GBPM is a good solution. And for the broken component, message brokers such as ActiveMQ, RabbitMQ, HarnetMQ are used as a lightweight solution. IBM WebSphereMQ is a comprehensive solution and it spans many aspects in event-driven systems. It provides messaging and queuing features as well as PubSub implementation. For scale and fault tolerance requirements, Apache Kafka is also a great broker and messaging solution in event-driven systems. And it also provides logging and event sourcing as well as other features features. And finally, Cloud Event is another technology that provides solutions for event declaration and delivery. It also standardizes event description for efficient handling of events, etc. Alright, last section, one of the most important things to keep in mind when designing an event-based system is the fact that everything is distributed and asynchronous. This implies taking into consideration some of the issues that may arise at runtime and plan for that. Event process availability is of crucial importance to keep in mind. Also, when using an event log to persist events pushed to the event queue, the system could get sluggish and the performance could decrease due to that. Finding a workaround or a solution to avoid that would be a good thing to do, such as persisting only a certain type of events. Another important consideration to take into account is the problem or fact that atomic transactions are very difficult in event-driven systems. This issue could be solved by choosing the right granularity of events, but mostly when a lot lot of cross-component transactions are involved, the event-driven architecture is not a good choice for such systems. Along with considerations, there are some pitfalls one could fail to notice when building an event-driven system. Choosing the thickest and most feature-rich messaging platform, for example using Kafka for simple systems, is a recipe for a quick disaster. And also going for a lightweight message broker when the system needs to process millions of events per day is a recipe for an even quicker disaster. Every solution and technology should be the right one for its specific requirements. Another pitfall is confusing events with requests. One could easily mistake certain types of requests with events. You should watch out for that, especially communication among event processors. And lastly, generic events. As we mentioned in the characteristics, events should be as fine-grained as possible. Specific events are more useful and easy to process than generic, more coarse-grained ones. And as we say always, it certainly depends on the type of the system and its functionality and what is expected of it to determine and define what to do, what to avoid, and what to expect. All right, that's it for this video. Hopefully you've enjoyed it and learned new things from it. Please don't forget to subscribe until the next video, stay well and stay tuned.